Good morning, friends. Uh, this is Ani Agniotri on behalf of uh, US India Business Summit. Uh, it's uh, indeed my honor and pleasure to host you uh, for the second day of uh, our 11th annual US India Business Summit and 26th annual Georgia Tech Global Business Forum. Uh, Dr. McIntyre is co-chair of uh, Georgia Tech Global Business Forum. We have been collaborating for last uh, almost 15, 18 years. And uh, now uh, it's my honor to welcome him to start this session. Dr. McIntyre. Thank, thank you, Annie, and welcome to day two, track one. We are going to uh, be welcomed and uh, welcome to uh, session one, track one, the panel uh, titled Innovation in the Post-Pandemic or really looking for a new normal. Uh, we understand innovation, of course, to, to include uh, the uh, digital transition process, which is very much on the mind of all of our participants. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sebastien, who has a wonderful presentation to share with us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon for the one that are overseas. Uh, I'm not going to go back on my background. Thank you very much, John, for this uh, very nice introduction. So the question for today is, are we seeing an acceleration of innovation and more specifically digital innovation due to uh, this pandemic uh, that we're calling COVID-19? Uh, but the bigger question I'd like to address today is, are we going to see a new era uh, of healthcare? As you know, there are many pain points in the healthcare and is it becoming a big catalyst uh, for innovation and this transformation? As you know, we uh, every time we have a huge crisis, uh, this is very proper ground and fertile ground for innovation. I mean, the, the First World War um, changed the aviation industry. The Cold War uh, led to a new era in terms of space uh, discovery. And the dot-com bust, the bubble bust, I think many people are saying that gave birth to companies like Google and Facebook. So the question, I think, are we going to see this new era of healthcare and who is going to lead the way? I think there are many interesting questions there. So before we diving in healthcare, we just wanted to talk about just generally speaking about innovation and give some numbers, uh, which is hard to find in terms of uh, quantification. So uh, McKinsey published, oh, sorry, going back, published a very interesting uh, report on how COVID-19 has pushed companies over the technology tipping point and may have changed business forever. So if we go at the broader picture, and again, this is not specific to the pharma environment, uh, we see like quite big jumps uh, in terms of acceleration. Um, the one that is not displayed here, but is the obvious is how we work, uh, how our kids are going to school. So we are all have uh, homes that are transformed into offices and, and schools. But uh, beyond that, we, we clearly see a digital transformation around how we interact with our customers. And this trend has started in the pharma industry uh, much sooner for other reasons that I'll mention briefly after. Uh, we see a significant increase, like twofold, in terms of new digital product launched in the market. And we can see that, of course, the e-commerce environment has completely changed. Uh, whether it's uh, the curbside pickup or many new uh, innovation. I mean, we've been talking about O2O, offline to online as, as a theme, but uh, we see that acceler acceleration. So the purpose is not good to do a deep dive, but just to give context and numbers on this uh, speed of uh, innovation and acceleration on the digital side. If we dive in a little bit more in pharma and healthcare, uh, one of the company I admire because they really led the way in terms of digital transformation in the pharma space is Novartis. We'll see the uh, information later that are quantified as well on where do they stand versus competition. But I really like that quote from the chief digital officer of Novartis that said the pandemic has as accelerating the scaling of adoption and of our transformation, challenging them to do in three months what they have done in three years. So when you are talking about acceleration, this gives you the scale of magnitude of the challenge they had in front of them. If we look at the pharma space, uh, we can divide two buckets. Um, one that has really accelerated due to COVID. I summarize it with a low touch economy. And uh, we believe that this is going to stay for a long time. Uh, and the second bucket are things that are including the first one, but were already initiative that we're working, worked on. 
but we've seen acceleration, uh, very rapid acceleration, especially I will talk about uh, research. So we've seen that transformation at unprecedented st speed, remote working and collaboration, something we talk all the time, remote selling, it's something that was initiated in the pharma space a um, uh, lot sooner. You've heard in the 2010 where a lot of sales reps were being let go because the pharma companies had more difficulty to reach out to the physicians and influence the decision-making process. Curbside pickup, we've seen it. And we'll talk briefly and give example of what's happening today with uh, telemedicine and remote, remote health monitoring. So if we go first, around the first bucket of what we're seeing. So the first one, the obvious is telemedicine. Uh, this, uh, we could call it, it's going mainstream and it's uh, innovation and it's going to be here to stay. It has profound implications for the patients and potentially for cost of healthcare. We're going to see reduction of costs thanks to telemedicine. It has implication for the pharma in terms of what type of information and what type of services they should be exploring uh, to not be disruptive but you can see the scale at which the adoption of telemedicine has happened. Uh, this is the example of two companies. One is uh, Doc Talk and the other one is uh, uh, Solve. The other one is uh, devices. We all know that as uh, Kristen, uh, Clayson, uh, Clayton, Claytonson said, uh, we have seen the healthcare moving closer to us. And now our devices like our smartphone play uh, a much bigger role in our lives. So GSK before COVID had launched a uh, uh, way to recognize COPD patients by just blowing into the cell phone. Uh, I truly invite you to look at the video Breath of Life from them. It's spectacular, it's done with an artist. It's very, very innovative and, and interesting. Other organization uh, have looked at devi the device to uh, innovate beyond COPD and we could ask ourselves, would we be able to diagnose things like COVID-19 just by blow, blowing in our cell phones? So very, very interesting innovation that is happening around um, uh, related to COVID-19 uh, with our cell phone. Another type of innovation that is not necessarily patient-centric, uh, but uh, doctor-centric, is how devices, even to diagnose professional uh, devices, linked to a cell phone coupled with AI to recognize patterns. So this is Butterfly IQ uh, that has invented a machine that you can connect to your cell phone and directly do uh, ultrasounds of your lungs and detect if you have, uh, for example, risk of COVID-19. So again, spectacular innovation happening very fast. Uh, of course, because of COVID-19, a lot of investment are poured in those different startups, which accelerate innovation and I believe are here to stay. Uh, we all talk about monitoring health at home uh, for elderly people or people at risk. Well, COVID-19, I think, has pushed us and accelerated that to uh, remove some of the pain point of going to the hospital and increasing risk of infections. So now companies have created like a monitoring patient kit that can be distributed at home and helps to evaluate for possible infection, but really staying at home. So I think that's another trend that we are going to see and, and are to stay. I have another one that is directly linked to, to uh, COVID-19, which I think India has leveraged significantly, uh, is around COVID-19 con contact tracing. Uh, so they really try to launch those devices to monitor, like for example, for quarantine issues, but also to detect if we are at risk to be in areas that are uh, more at risk for, uh, to be contaminated. What is interesting in that uh, uh, environment is it's already hinting about the end of the presentation, you can see that Apple and Google are spending an uh, extreme amount of resources uh, to create valuable application that could be used by hundreds millions of users. And again, that's to me a very interesting pattern uh, of how those technologies company are evolving, evolving very fast into uh, the healthcare environment. So now that we've seen like the first phase, um, we're moving in the second element. Trends that were happening, but we could almost call it low signal. Um, but it's a very complex topic. There are many innovations happening in healthcare around technology with sensors and nanotech and wearables and eatables. 
uh, things you are putting, tattoos that are connected, putting on your skins, AI, blockchains, a lot of things. Uh, now, the pain points in the industry are very severe. You know, in the US, you had 70% of GDP in terms of cost. The average OECD is around uh, 9%. Uh, but I think another opportunity on healthcare is how do you move from a sick care uh, to a preventive care and personalized care? Uh, why do we have to wait to be sick, to be cured, while we could do things much earlier and avoid uh, sickness by changing our behavior, for example? So are we going to enter in a new era of medicine and healthcare because of all those accelerations during the pandemic? I think is the big question. For the pharma space, they have a lot of issues to address. And if we could focus on research, you know, we're in a race to find the vaccines for, um, for uh, COVID-19. Uh, the average uh, time to find a drug is about 10 years. For vaccines, probably more around six or seven years. Uh, companies are spending billions of dollars. They have a 90% uh, chance of failure rate. So in this context, are we going to see acceleration of things that will help us to mitigate some of those costs or time to market? <clears throat> so we see the emergence of technologies such as deep learning, uh, very, very scientific uh, ways to leverage data to try to identify potential target molecule that will help to address some of the uh, disease we are trying to mitigate. In this case, is a case about COVID-19 where uh, they were trying to avoid like the cytokine rush or cytokine storm. Uh, and they've identified four candidates very fast uh, while using technology. And you see on the page like hydroxychloroquine, which has been a uh, during a lot of debate, but you also see remdesivir that has been uh, recently approved by the FDA. So again, we, we see like a tremendous acceleration of leveraging those very complex algorithm and machine learning. Blockchain is another uh, area very interesting uh, because there are many different models happening in, uh, in the pharma space, including ability to uh, buy your rights. Uh, there is a company called AI Evolve where you could buy your right to a future medicines to reduce the cost for you to access that, that innovation. But this one around Melody is extremely interesting where we go beyond the traditional competition between competitors and it creates an environment where companies can collaborate while protecting their intellectual properties. Uh, and we do hope that uh, it will improve ability to uh, uh, create new innovation and better patient care. Um, another way uh, where we see tools and collaborative environments where people are getting together, and this one is, is a fascinating story because uh, UCB, which is an Atlanta-based company, was the first pharma to join that COVID-19 moonshot, which was about bringing together international scientists from academia, and they have pulled their expertise together to find uh, candidate compounds uh, around uh, the activity of COVID-19. What is fascinating is the speed at which they were able to collect 7,000 submissions uh, uh, for IDs. And we can see that collaboration linked to uh, technologies like Zoom and other things can really accelerate uh, uh, innovation. And, you know, it starts to pay off. Uh, it's not linked to COVID-19, but uh, uh, we have the first AI drug uh, that are emerging through uh, for clinical trial. On the, on the left side, you have uh, on a very important topic, which is antibiotic resistant bacteria, MIT came back with an algorithm that was detecting how we could bring um, uh, compounds to market that would help solve the issue of um, uh, antibi antibiotic resistant bacteria. On the right side, it's the first drug that is going to go to clinical trial where AI was really at the core of uh, the research. And it's for obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, it's a partnership between Existencia, which is an AI-based drug discovery company based in the UK, and Sumitomo based in Japan. So again, we see really that acceleration happening at a speed uh, that is unprecedented, which is very complex for organizations to adjust to this new reality. What I'd like to bring as a close is who's going to lead the way uh, in this race of the new era for healthcare. I do have a personal uh, uh, love for this quote, chance favor the prepper mind in so many ways, but the fact that Louis Pasteur, uh, which was heavily involved in the discovery of um, a vaccination principle with the first rabies vaccines in 1885, 
uh, a lot of activity in my hometown in Lyon in France. So I, I really do like that quote and I do believe it's really relevant for digital transformation. Uh, this is some numbers from uh, uh, McKinsey again, basically that says that company that were first in their industry to experiment with new technology during the crisis had seen a 25% growth in the past three years. This is just to say and hint that when people are really exploring and have an organization that uh, welcome change and seek that change and invest in change, understand the risk around it, uh, they can become I and mean, emerge as a true leader. In the pharma side, in July 15, we had the first peer reviewed analysis on how drug companies were investing in AI technology for uh, drug discoveries. Uh, and they were looking at joint venture, cooperation with startups, R&D alliances, alliances, and internal R&D project with IP submissions. And we've seen that Novartis has really emerged as a strong leader with AstraZeneca. And then you can see that Boehringer, Ingelheim, and some others uh, is almost in a different type of uh, tier. So with all the challenges that pharma is facing right now on the difficulty to launch new drug to market, you, you know, you've heard about the patent cliff. Um, we, it's really interesting to see of who is going to lead the race. But I think there is a fundamental question uh, that we all know AI technology is very hard to manage. There are very few scientists in the world that uh, can bring meaningful uh, innovation based on it. And I would like to bring your attention on one uh, thing that was uh, spotted by this report. And uh, to me is, Will the pharma or healthcare company continue to lead this race? Because we are seeing that they call it a great brain drain. AI professors departing US University for technology companies. And you can see that all the big talent from university are being absorbed by the top technology players. And I've seen in the example as well that um, Google and Apple were really pushing on application to help mitigate um, uh, contact tracing and other things. But also two FDA approved uh, devices were from a technology company. So who is going to lead this uh, new era of healthcare? Because we have a lot of pain points to, to solve. I think uh, this may give us a hint, but definitely the, the healthcare player can play a role and they need to react. So again, thank you for your time. I hope you find it interesting and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Excellent presentation. We're grateful. We're going to wait till the end for Q&A. So uh, we're, we're moving next to our friend Nirupa Shankar, who is joining us from uh, Bangalore. And we're moving from the pharma space to the real estate space. Uh, Nirupa uh, has been uh, uh, leading brigade group for the past the past 11 years. It's one of India's top developers, top 10 developers. She oversees in particular the company's hotel, office, retail portfolios, which is a very large portfolio indeed. She, is, she has the serial entrepreneurial bug, and which means she has essentially been involved in a variety of, uh, of startups and also received a number of recognitions and awards. Uh, she set up the first real estate accelerator which we've been talking about called Brigade Real Estate Accelerator Program, REAP, R-E-A-P, an, an initiative to mentor high-tech startups in real estate. So indeed our presentation will focus on the process of innovation, on the impact of digital transformation, but also applied very clearly to the real estate context in India, an India that has changed so much and so fast. So to join us, please welcome Nirupa, Nirupa Shankar, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Um, Sebastian, that was a very interesting presentation and um, I hope I can do justice to mine. Uh, so let me just share my uh, screen right now. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's evening here, but I'm sure most of the listeners are across, so wherever you are. Um, I thought I will just focus on a little bit, basically I'll focus on the real estate sector and just talk about the current scenario and basically what the impact has been pre and post COVID and what are the trends that we are seeing because of COVID in this industry. So just a few numbers, just to give you um, some background and a sense of what the industry is like in India. Uh, the sector is actually um, 
expected to reach about a trillion dollars by 2030. So it may not be as huge as the global markets like in the US or China, but in terms of scale, it is expected to reach a trillion dollars by 2030, uh, mostly because of the rapid urbanization that we are seeing in India. Almost 70% of the country's GDP is coming from the urban areas. Um, so the sector is about th contributes about 13% uh, to the country's GDP, and it's actually the highest, uh, second highest employment generator. Um, real estate actually invited about six billion dollars of investment in 2019. There are a lot of American private equity players here investing heavily, like Brookfield and Blackstone, in the Indian uh, real estate segment. Uh, retail also is not as large; it attracted only about a billion dollars of investment which just goes to show the kind of um, scale that, the, that there is potential to do. Um, the office segment, which is again part of real estate, actually had its best year in 2019, where the absorption of office space was 60 million square feet across just eight cities, the key metro cities in the country. Um, an emerging industry in the real estate space is warehousing. Um, and that is expected to see almost uh, as much investment as the uh, residential side of the business at about $7 billion, uh, because this is a sunrise industry in India right now. And uh, just in terms of scale, again, we, India sold about ju uh, just about 260,000 units of homes in 2019 in the seven major cities. So that's just giving you numbers uh, to go by the size of the economy uh, uh, of real estate. And now if you look at the two graphs, um, one shows um, obviously how demand has dropped in, in FY21. Uh, we, we are expected to see at least a 50 to 60% decline in overall demand. And um, the good, the sort of good news for us is that, you know, the market share of um, the top 10 players has, is increasing drastically. I would say that um, almost 50% of the smaller developers have closed because of COVID-19. And uh, that means that the top 10 developers in the country have the ability to increase their market share in terms of the number of units of homes sold. Uh, from an office perspective, if you look at FY21 figures, as I mentioned, FY20 was a fabulous year for uh, office real estate. Um, it's dropped by about, the vacancy rate has basically increased uh, by about 10%. Uh, if you look at it, the uh, vacancy rate, which was just about 15%, has gone up to about 18%. Uh, but if you look at it from an overall absorption perspective, we're expecting even the office segment to, to decline by about 45 to 50%. And that's mainly because the first half of the year saw very uh, limited uptake. And that was because India went through, I guess, one of the largest lockdowns uh, amongst all countries. And we were basically locked down from March to May, end of March to almost end of May, where there was absolutely no activity done. Uh, but the second half of the year, we are expected to see a fairly decent uptake. But I guess for FY21, uh, it will be significantly impacted by the first half of the year. So there will be a massive drop in the office uptake as well. So um, just to give you a quick couple of line synopsis overall, um, as I mentioned, because of COVID-19, the interesting aspect is that we actually saw the number of uh, units, um, uh, actually the size of the units that were bought by customers actually increase. So I would say if the sweet spot for uh, a unit size in say Bangalore City was say $100,000 to buy uh, say a three bedroom apartment, um, this actually increased to almost double or almost 50 to 60% up just because people wanted an additional bedroom uh, because of the whole work from home um, uh, aspect. So people expect to be working more from home. So while the first quarter of FY21 was very slow with hardly like maybe 40% of the activity of a normal quarter, um, the second quarter of FY21 actually saw uh, demand increase to pre-COVID levels. And I think that's because of the pent up uh, demand for real estate. And like I said, the size of the apartments uh, that people are demanding are bigger. And we, we think that's because of the whole work from home aspect, uh, which COVID-19 has brought in. Uh, from office, as I mentioned, the first half of the year saw 50% dip in the uptake of office space. Uh, but overall, we expect the demand to sort of come back to pre-COVID levels in FY22. Uh, we think that the latent demand still exists and that demand will not disappear. 
but there there is just a delay in the decision making obviously because international travel is not completely there's no pre movement of international travel and a lot of the large decision makers for uh, these large office spaces are uh, abroad and uh, on and they live in um, uh, international areas like either the us or uk or wherever the headquarters of the company are um i would say retail and hospitality were two of the worst hit sectors within the real estate space <clears throat> but um you know the the cinemas and restaurants and a lot of the stores were closed for many months in fact the cinemas were closed from end of march till mid october so they were extremely badly hit and the walk uh, and the walk ins into the mall and the footfalls drastically dropped um and by the time the malls opened it was we were just getting about a tenth or a fraction of what we were of the footfalls that we were getting pre covid uh but the interesting aspect is that in q2 um we are actually yeah in q2 uh once the malls opened we are actually uh seeing that the retail some of the retail stores are back to 50 to 70% of their pre covid business which means that while the number of people walking into a mall have drastically reduced it's only the serious shoppers coming in because the malls are doing um fairly well uh and they're bouncing back very quickly and we expect that um uh, by FY22 they should be back to pre covid levels um uh, as i mentioned is the hotel space again that was very significantly hit um the average room rates were down by 50 60% now they are probably down by say 40% or so even occupancies have been uh, were drastically hit some of the hotels were doing single digits uh, for a while and obviously month on month um, things have improved once the lockdown eased up um, but overall for fy21 we do expect that business will be down again by 50 to 60% uh, but the savior has been food and beverage because obviously people want to eat and they want to socialize and even while people may not want to come into office they do want to go into restaurants and socialize because um india did have a very strict lockdown and people were uh, homebound for, for quite a few months um so just couple of uh points i guess in terms of numbers you know the the construction industry is one of the lowest in productivity if you see the graph on the left uh, it basically shows uh, in rupees but it basically what it's showing is that the construction industry has one of the lowest productivity figures uh because it's a very manual way of construction in india still uh we haven't used too much mechanization yet for our construction so in terms of product productivity it's still very low and what we see is that the uh, uh construction space spends less than 1% of their top line on technology and um this is part of the reason why construction is still so very manual in india and um, obviously this th th this means that there are a lot of delays in terms of uh, project um uh, budgeting and cost and time runs you know so that there's always delay in a lot of projects so i think what covid has sort of brought in is um there are few emerging trends but i would say the top 3 are basically obviously the um ex the expectation that real estate companies will embrace the digital space uh her virtual is the new actual and um as i mentioned before brand and credibility is paramount especially for something like real estate because many people put in their life savings into their homes um and since so many of the developers have closed down a lot of projects have been stalled developers are unable to complete many of their projects uh brand uh, and the credibility of a developer to complete their projects become paramount for anybody who's looking to buy so that is why even in the previous uh, slide we saw that the market share of the top 10 developers is um, increasing so just a couple of uh, technology trends that we have seen due to this pandemic and uh, one is obviously from a residential real estate perspective you know we've seen a lot of virtual reality uh, for sales because people are unable to travel people don't want to move out of their homes people don't want to come to the site to take a look at the mock up apartment so we're having to use a lot of virtual reality of um, not just the apartment but the areas around it what is it, you know where is the nearest school where is the nearest social infrastructure in terms of malls restaurants uh, we're also using a lot of um, uh, customer relationship management tools that kind of use big data to improve our conversion ratio right to just check uh, who has clicked on what on a, on various social media platforms so the technology for figuring out how strong a lead is um is increasing and 
our ability to sort of narrow down who is actually has the propensity to buy or, or the probability of every lead that comes in to say what is the probability that this person will actually buy an apartment is um, getting enhanced by the nature of the tools out there and lastly i would say for from a residential perspective sustainability is important you know people do want uh, homes that um, have water management tools have um, uh, energy saving tools they want smarter homes they want uh, gated communities with uh, security measures so uh, sustainability in terms of ensuring that the every project has enough water because in some areas water is a problem uh, is becoming extremely important um, they want to see the architecture of the homes to ensure that there's natural sunlight there's proper ventilation um, in order to use less electricity as well in the office space, I guess what is most important, I would say in office and uh, hospitality is contactless uh, access management. So that when you enter a hotel, you don't want to be touching anything. If you want to go to your floor in, in, in the office or a hotel, people don't want to be touching the elevator button. So a lot of, um, there are companies doing this. Uh, Spintly, for instance, which is one of, our, one of the startups in our program does this. And uh, I would say, you know, currently there's a massive fear psychosis of people um, in order to enter office. Like I said, people don't mind being in the outdoors. They don't mind going to a restaurant which which has an outdoor space. But the moment it talks, but the moment there's talk of coming to an office, people have massive fear psychosis, mostly because of the circulation of the air. So what we're seeing is we're seeing technology being um, significantly improved with the HVAC system, which is the heat ventilation and uh, air conditioning system. So previously, if uh, the HVAC system could sort of filter particles at say 2.5 microns, um, the technology and the filtration systems for our HVAC systems has drastically improved. And now the filters can filter up to 0.1 microns. And while they say that, you know, uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus is not airborne, it can sit on particles and move uh, and move through the air. Um, so that's, uh, but the point one should, the point one micron filtration system should help, um, you know, filter out these uh, virus particles as well if they are sort of sitting on some other larger particles to move around. So there are companies like Clairco that, that do this. And so I think India has seen a lot of uh, focus on clean air. Uh, within the office because sometimes the air quality indoors is worse than what it is outdoors. So uh, clean air is becoming very important for indoor spaces like office and retail. Um, in retail also, what we're seeing is sanitation of public places and toilets. Uh, you know, previously, like I said, in India, everything is fairly manual. So you'd have a person standing uh, in within the washrooms of, say, a mall or any public space and, you know, cleaning the place after uh, somebody uses it. Now there are tools that sort of automatically clean uh, the washroom seats and um, that's seeing pretty good uh, traction in the malls because again, people don't want uh, other people crowding into small washroom spaces. Also what's happening is while many of those larger MNC stores and retails like your Zara's and your Marks and Spencer's and Gap, they might have very good online platforms to sell their uh, clothing and their wares. Many of the local brands don't have a very uh, strong online platform. So what a lot of mall developers are doing, including ourselves, is we're trying to find a platform that can sort of bring all the local stores and of course the international ones if they choose to join the platform so that consumers can basically go online to figure out all the inventory within a store and buy online. Because again, people don't really want to be entering a mall if they don't have to. And again, obviously contactless payment is uh, paramount now and nobody, uh, but, but there, there's enough technology for that. So the companies doing, say, the sanitization of the public toilets is called SanIoT, which again, these are some of the uh, startups doing all of this within our program. Um, and on the hospitality side, of course, as I mentioned, contactless access management is important because nobody wants to be touching anything in public spaces. Uh, sanitation, as I already mentioned, and of course, the air quality, which, which, which Clairco does to filter out the smaller air particles. Obviously, water and air management is important as well, and there are a lot of startups like we got um, uh, doing that. Just a quick uh, couple of notes on the kind of uh, on where the prop tech scene is in India. So, if you just look at the prop tech uh, startups globally, about eleven thousand startups were founded since two thousand eleven. 
And India actually contributes about 17% of just the real estate tech startups founded in this space. And uh, out of all the startups that have been founded, uh, uh, that have been funded, 13% of these startups have been funded from India. Um, also, in terms of funding, what we're also seeing is that the prop tech space is receiving a lot of attention just in the last two, three years. Of course, 2018 and 19 were very strong for the prop tech, prop tech space. But if you look at a period of five years, this industry attracted almost $60 billion globally. And within India, it attracted about 5% of the overall global funding. Um, lastly, in terms of technology, what I wanted to say was, this is actually, I'm going to uh, conclude here. Um, I just want to say that, you know, because of COVID-19, it's actually seen a lot more of um, attention given to technology. Because if you look at it, you know, the developers in general um, have a lot of the public, uh, the, the developers that are in the public markets, if you look at their balance sheets and their PNL statements, you see that the profits are pretty much in the single digits. And that means if profits are wafer thin, people need, in order to stay afloat, you need to do whatever you can uh, to either enhance your productivity, increase your revenues, or optimize your costs. And technology seems to be the best way to go about it. So actually, technology has been receiving a lot of attention. In fact, uh, six startups just from our uh, program received funding during, um, during the lockdown, you know, where hardly any commercial activity was going on. And um, as I mentioned, you know, since almost half the smaller, 50% of the smaller developers have actually shut shop, the focus on technology is even more. And I think that's why it makes it very interesting to see the nature of the trends uh, in this industry. Um, so I'd like to conclude with that. Um, if uh, happy to take questions later on, uh, this is my email at ID if anybody wants to get in touch. Thank you very much, Nirupa, for a, a, a really a a, uh, a tour d'horizon of the real estate industry and the innovation applications that you have been uh, leading in. Uh, we, we look forward to uh, your answering quite a few questions uh, as soon as our next presenter, who is my friend and colleague, Professor Christopher Lutgen, uh, uh, completes his presentation. Let me introduce him a little bit. He is a man who wears many hats, over 30 years experience in the, uh, in the industry, pulp, paper, tissue, packaging, an industry that's changing on, on account of technology. Uh, experience with Scott Paper and Kimberly Clark. Currently is chairman of the board of the Technical Association of the Pulp and Paper Industry, known as TAPI. Uh, he serves on the Georgia Tech Renewable Bioproducts Industry uh, Board of Advisors. He's a professor of the practice involved in uh, the field of uh, creating leaders in manufacturing. He's a chemist, chemical engineer by training with a degree in uh, surface chemistry. He's an innovator involved in uh, startups and an educator. And I take it also a researcher. So he's all these things combined. So welcome, good to see you again. Good to see you, John. And I'm also a friend of John McIntyre. So, I, so as uh, John mentioned, I have a couple of hats, uh, professor of chemical and biomedical engineering, associate director of RBI, the Renewable Bioproducts Institute, and also uh, associated with, uh, with a, a number of programs at Georgia Tech. The Renewable Bioproducts Institute, just to give you a little bit of introduction for those who are not aware, uh, and, and I tip my hat off into the Scheller College of Business at, at Tech. We're on opposite sides of campus, but we collaborate so much. Uh, but we're one of 11 interdisciplinary research institutes at Georgia Tech. And we try to facilitate this collaboration between faculty and be a portal for uh, the forest products industry in general, but also anything to do with biomass. Uh, we report uh, not necessarily to the academic area of Georgia Tech, but to the executive vice president for research. And we generally engage with faculty across the College of Engineering and the College of Science. Uh, and at least six schools among those two colleges on a constant basis. Uh, the Legacy Endowment supports a vibrant graduate student fellowship program, and I'll get into that. But our vision is we want to be this premier institute for advanced and translational research in, into renewables. Uh, and we are this conduit across disciplines for faculty and industry to collaborate. And uh, we have graduate students that are highly ranked, of course, 
We currently support about 40 PhD students on full ride fellowships and stipends. If their research has to do with renewables for the uh, for, for biomass. Uh, and uh, we also have a very good research staff and we do comprehensive chemical analysis. So across these realms of faculty support with the stipends and, and seed money for research, we also have student fellowships. We collaborate across these other interdisciplinary research institutes and the schools of Georgia Tech. We have quite a elaborate analytical services for testing, uh, quite a bit of forensics work that the FBI or, or GBI turned to, Georgia Bureau of In Investigation turned to for uh, forensics work. Uh, we often collaborate with industry, having just hosted a two-day workshop last week on separation processes for biorefining uh, was our topic last week. Uh, we also have uh, an educational program across the undergraduate and uh, graduate schools and outreach uh, through uh, the only museum on Georgia Tech's campus is dedicated to the 2000 year history of making paper. Uh, the Institute of Paper Chemistry started in Appleton, Wisconsin, 91 years ago, and um, then moved to be part of Georgia Tech uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, complete merger in 2003, and rebranded from the Institute of Paper to the Renewable Bioproducts Institute, recognizing we do much more than just paper. We are a four-year fellowship program for PhD students across these four schools of Georgia Tech and currently are collaborating with 40 graduate students, uh, two of which are mine, uh, working in various areas. So we also have this master's degree in manufacturing leadership uh, through the professional education program of Georgia Tech. And this allows people to uh, take an alternative to an MBA uh, when they want to focus on a manufacturing uh, operational leadership. And this uh, is a great collaboration with the, uh, the Scheller College of Business at Tech in that several courses are offered from the College of Business and from the College of Engineering to make a well-rounded operational excellence uh, type of uh, leader. Uh, my own research efforts, uh, just to give you some background here, uh, we have a PhD student working on big data analytics and transforming the paper industry, looking at smart manufacturing. And I'll get into a little bit more of that, uh, particularly when it comes to the Southeast United States and transforming our industry. I also look at nanofibrillated celluloses uh, in consumer products and liner board. I, I look at nanocellulose crystals and how we might manufacture those. Uh, we have a collaboration with dye stuffs manufacturers and we also uh, have a brand new PhD looking at biodegradable polyethylene phthalate for packaging applications uh, because uh, very, very few people want to recycle PET uh, to make bottles or to make films and uh, these wind up of course in our oceans and uh, and all over the place and only about uh, according to the MacArthur Foundation about four percent of uh, plastics actually get recycled to make plastics. So where does the rest go? We've looked at polylactic acid as a bio-renewable resource. Uh, we've looked at wet forming with zinc chloride to make durable things like flatware to replace polypropylene forks and knives and uh, molded fiber alternatives to fluorocarbons as we try to remove fluorocarbons from our products. Uh, and I also have a, a nice startup company that's uh, hoping to launch a new bio-based wet wipe for all wet wipe applications next year. Uh, just to look about the invention of paper briefly, uh, this was one of the four great inventions from China attributed to this uh, gentleman, Sai Lun, who credited in 105 AD. Uh, through archaeological evidence, it seems like paper was being made for over 300 years prior to that but he wrote the process of how to make it. An initial paper was made from hemp ropes reconstituted into these uh, paper processes. Uh, we, we eventually, essentially use the same tools that have been used for these 2000 years to make paper. We simply make it automated. Here's a depiction of what a European uh, paper making process in, a, in an open building might've looked like in the 14, 1500s with a vat man pulling a sheet of paper, a lay boy cooching uh, the material off of the, uh, off the wire, and then dry men air drying the finished product in, a, in an open warehouse or in the sunlight outside. 
And this is a courtesy of our uh, Museum of Papermaking, which is housed in my building on the northwest side of campus. But since the 1850s, we started seeing the automation of papermaking. This is Louis Nicolas Robert, who had the first continuous way of making a, uh, a sheet of paper uh, that did not have to be handmade. Uh, and then about the 1850s, 60s, this is, happens to be a picture of my great grandfather, who was a blacksmith and invented a way of drying that sheet continuously uh, and won a couple of gold medals at uh, various uh, uh, world fairs. But paper machines today are very highly automated and we uh, estimate over 900,000 employees in the United States work in this industry. It contributes about four and a half percent of our U.S. gross domestic product. Uh, these are very high speed machines now running 5,000 to 7,000 feet per minute of continuous paper and uh, very, very wide, 300, 400 inches wide machines. Uh, very different than that uh, machine just 200 years ago. This is from Voith Corporation, one of the lar three large manufacturers of uh, paper machine equipment. And they're showing you here how the speed of machines has really taken off over the last 100 years. And these machines are now uh, approaching 7,000 feet per minute. Uh, and this could be tissue manufacturing or liner board for boxes. And here is the maximum width of a paper machine now over 400, 450 inches wide uh, is, is really automating this kind of machine. And what I want to point out here is whereas eight, machine, eight men may have been running a machine that is very small, maybe running 500 feet per minute just 70 years ago, we now see three people in an air conditioned operating room running uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of tons a day of paper. So the labor density has taken several step changes during these same decades of people hours per ton. And this has resulted in mm -hmm. US manufacturing jobs basically staying here in the United States, particularly a move to the Southeast United States in the 1960s and 1970s as technology and innovation taught us how to now utilize Southern pine as a tremendous resource and the quick ro crop rotation of uh, 10, 12 years to turn over land using Southern pine. Uh, but it was really in the 1960s, 1970s that we had the innovation to be able to utilize Southern pine to make strong products. And we saw this migration uh, from the Midwest, from New England to the Southeast United States to utilize this very inexpensive, but now suddenly uh, available to make strong paper uh, a product. So I want to jump into what has been happening lately in during COVID-19. Um, so in particular segments, we've seen some severe supply chain shortages, as you may have recognized going to your own grocery store, particularly bath tissue and hand towels. Uh, and this continues today. Uh, and and uh, I was recently interviewed by a, a large uh, U.S. newspaper as to why. Why is bath tissue and hand towel continuing to be a supply chain issue for, for consumers uh, in spite of the fact that it's been many, many months? Uh, so we also have seen standard hospital PPE, such as masks, hand sanitizers, and surface disinfectants. I was uh, on our task team earlier this year asked by the governor of Georgia to look at how can we de-bottleneck some of these uh, healthcare supplies. Uh, one of the projects that we worked on was to utilize uh, a, an underutilized resource uh, these days because people are not driving so much, is that ethanol uh, used in, uh, uh, mixed in with gasoline is very underutilized these days as less people have been driving. But there is a severe shortage of both isopropyl and as a U.S. pharmaceutical grade ethanol for hand sanitizers. Fortunately, the World Health Organization and the FDA followed and allowed the use of lesser ethanols as long as they were purified. And we were able to work with uh, some very large suppliers such as ExxonMobil to commercialize the first of a kind of fuel grade ethanol, uh, waiver ethanol converted with proper distillation and carbon filtration to a very acceptable and safe hand sanitizer to supplement the U.S. supply. But we also looked at the reuse of PPE. 
Uh, we've manufactured uh, hundreds of thousands of, of masks and shields, face shields at, uh, at Georgia Tech to help the supply chain, uh, particularly here in the Southeast. But let's go back to bath tissue and hand towels. One of the key things around the supply chain of bath tissue and hand towels that people don't realize is that home bath tissue and hand towels are very different, if you, if you may have realized, than what you see in an in a office building or a conference center or a stadium. Uh, these high volume rolls, maybe a hard roll towel or a folded towel are very different than the kitchen roll towel that you'd use in your kitchen. And so by people working from home, suddenly we see this migration away from the volume that is being produced for the, the off, away from home business, the commercial business of office buildings and restaurants and uh, conference centers and stadiums and gas stations to the use of home single, single bath tissues uh, in a pack and hand towels in a perforated kitchen towel. That's a very different converting operation. It may be the same manufacturing of a large roll off of a continuous paper machine, but it's a very different converting into the finished product. And this is where the bottleneck was. Not only did we see hoarding of uh, personal hoarding of bath tissue and hand towels and pulling lots of material off the grocery shelf, but we also saw this tremendous shift from the away from home product formats to the consumer retail uh, product formats. And this was what created this tremendous shortage that continues because people are working from home and not using those big hard roll towels or big jumbo mm. roll tissues that you normally see in the, uh, in the away from home business. So some segments see manageable increased demand, such as e-commerce packaging. If you're in packaging right now, you're doing very well. So the biggest producer of paper in the world, international paper, uh, is doing well, making about 60% of Amazon's boxes. And so that uh, is so home delivery of things, uh, whether it be your groceries or your shopping online more than you ever did before. Uh, this has certainly been a boon to packaging. Uh, and this includes uh, the, the, the very high-end packaging for fragrances or cosmetics or shampoo. Everything is these days in a, uh, in a carton or a box, and this is usually multicolored printed, very high quality. So if you're in packaging like International Paper, West Rock, Georgia Pacific, these are companies that are doing well in the packaging area. Also, home printing suddenly took off. So instead of you know, your office building supplying all of your home printing needs or all of your printing needs in the office. Now suddenly you're printing a lot more at home. One of the things I came to realize is that cartridges became a shortage for my home printer. And suddenly I couldn't print because there was a backlog of, of uh, cartridges for, for printing at home. But some have seen a great decreased demand and some devastating collapse during these last uh, six to seven months, mm. such as cocktail napkins. If you think about Las Vegas, think about uh, all the casinos across the country uh, or just bars in general, uh, no one is using uh, heavily dyed colored napkins. And so you see a lot of home kitchen napkins, but not these heavily dyed napkins. So all the supply chain of using or making, manufacturing these uh, maybe black folded napkins or red folded napkins for parties or for gatherings, uh, for, for birthday parties, for weddings. These, there's no large weddings, right? So there's no use of these napkins. And this is actually called, uh, caused month long, multi month long curtailments of several US manufacturers who were in this business and really didn't have the capital or the timing to pull the trigger on new converting operations to make something different. Also, I mentioned the away from home or commercial tissue and towel business, single roll wrapped bath and jumbo roll tissue versus consumer pack is a very different uh, converting operation. And why can't people react fast? It's because the manufacturers, these, these particular converting operations might be 10 to $30 million each to cut up maybe a third of a paper machine's total capacity. And they might have 18 to 24 month backlog on delivering you a new piece of converting equipment. So the reaction time is just not there. 
So some labor trends and the call to alarm recently, but has been accelerated during this COVID time, is what are the next step changes in labor density? So the average age of a practicing engineer in this industry, uh, due to prior recessions and not hiring to backfill engineering, uh, is 56 plus. So I'm in that category. And so we have this average age of a practicing engineer soon to retire or, or uh, you know, uh, go away. And so operators and maintenance workers are also retiring or nearing retirement rapidly. And so there's this huge age and talent gap in this manufacturing sector uh, we cause, caused by the zero hiring during some downturns in the economy. And there's a severe sense that we will be lacking domain knowledge to operate and maintain these large, highly capitalized pieces of equipment, uh, let alone problem solve or troubleshoot. So some of the manufacturing outlook we've seen is that big data and smart manufacturing have really gotten uh, hold of this industry, the idea of industry 4.0, extremely large data sets we want to analyze to reveal patterns and trends. And uh, we see uh, more networking control and management, perhaps uh, remote uh, management and control. Uh, I was uh, teaching uh, online one of our uh, master's students working for one of the large uh, Southeast paper producers recently. And uh, there was an exposure to COVID at his workplace and he was sent home to be quarantined for 14 days. But he is the operations manager of his machines could watch the operation very clearly from his own home computer. He could actually control it if he wanted to, or he could communicate and uh, subsequently control from his own uh, office, home office. So these are definitely things that we see in this uh, more highly automated manufacturing. We also see some great innovation around reliability monitoring and management. Uh, there's a professor at Georgia Tech in industrial and systems engineering, Nagi Gabriel, who's doing sensor-based predictive analytics and machine learning and asset management so that we have better prediction of when things will fail and that we can manage uh, spare parts and inventory of equipment much better with, uh, with, with big data on the uh, predictive analytics of, of standard pieces of equipment. And Dr. Cameron Panabar uh, and I have been collaborating with a startup company called Process Miner. And this is looking at real-time utilization of distributed control systems for predicting quality every second on a paper machine running 6,000, 7,000 feet per minute and troubleshooting in advance to make sure that we're making consistent quality every moment. So this is a, a schematic from Process Miner of what they would look like from a distributed control system across multiple mills of a corporation, mm. looking at the data and, and analyzing it on a continuous basis, learning from it continuously so that you don't just stay idle, uh, but uh, controlling the process in real time and looking at the entirety of a paper uh, making operation for all the sensors, looking at sheet breaks, looking at strength of the sheet, looking at whether the quality is consistent every moment. So why are we looking at this? This potential here is we believe that we could save about $10 million per year for, for the producers that are producing over half a million tons per year per mill. And 90% of all mills in the United States lack sufficient and advanced measurement and control. <clears throat> so we've got a number of pilots occurring at the Southeast United States paper mills right now that are uh, subscribing to this service and then getting better analytics uh, for their quality rather than a large roll kicking out every 60 minutes and testing once in that whole 60 minute time frame, every second that that pr uh, production is being made can be analyzed for what we believe the strength is. So a very small percentage of mills currently have this capability. Uh, we also see that mills lack skilled engineers. There's a tremendous amount of hiring going on in this industry. Just from my own courses at Georgia Tech, uh, companies come to my classroom now virtually, of course, to give guest lectures on what a career looks like in their industry and, and stick around and then talk about resumes. And so uh, we see in the long term, a smaller population of skilled people. Uh, and so this subscription process uh, from a company such as Process Miner and some of its competitors, this seems to be very timely. 
Um, so what does the future look like for bioproducts? We certainly see, and some people tell me, the paper industry is dying, right? I mean, nothing's going on in paper. Well, certainly in some segments, right? Newsprint has continued to decay as people let, take less subscriptions of the New York Times and USA Today, unless you're at a hotel, and who's doing that these days? And printing and writing papers has seen a decay as well, but it's certainly a, a new influx for home printing. But we also see tremendous growth in fluff pulp for personal care articles, such as diapers, particularly in developing countries, such as uh, you know, the, the developing countries where maybe the middle class can afford disposable diapers and fluff pulp in particular. In China, Brazil, we're seeing 20% CAGR uh, of uh, personal care articles like diapers. Viscose, Lyocell, Rayon, these products are being in higher demand for clothing and industrial products. Packaging, we see a very healthy industry in packaging and in tissue as well. Uh, continued uh, growth. About only one third of the world's population currently uses a bath tissue kind of product. So two thirds are what is deemed to be this growth opportunity for many uh, of the consumer products companies. We see specialty grades continuing to grow for many products, not of course during the COVID time for people like the napkin industry, but others. Uh, we also see uh, tremendous interest in the possibilities of nanocellulose in products and biocomposites for aircraft and cars, uh, biorefineries for sugars, getting value from the lignin byproduct of biomass is, is a continued to be of interest and other value added products that could potentially replace petrochemicals. So we see a lot of hiring. This graying tsunami often called uh, is causing a, a backfill need for new engineers. Uh, we see the capacity uh, coming online of new capacity and rebuilds, investing in older mills. Uh, we see my TAPI organization association memberships at an all time high. And we see some new divisions of TAPI really taking off. I wanna give a nod to our member companies who support our research at Georgia Tech at the Renewable Bioproducts Institute or the undergraduate pulp and paper program. And I will be happy to take questions. Uh, my executive director, Carson Meredith, and I uh, will be happy to be in contact with you if you wish at any time to talk some more. So I will wrap it up. And I think we still have uh, 20 minutes or so for questions, John, I'll hand it to you to moderate. Thank you, Chris. Excellent presentation. Great overview of a fast moving industry reaching really most parts of our life on a daily basis. So from uh, pharma to real estate to pulp and paper and biorenewable, the process of innovation and digital digitalization have had varied impacts. I will not quiz you with the following question. What is the commonality in innovatory process across these three uh, industries? But I will ask you, what are the takeaways from your respective industry segments that apply across the board? Lessons that you have learned that could be shared and applied to other industries illustrated by the ones we featured today but other industries that uh, we encounter in our daily life. And uh, the second question would be, is the R&D process being overtaken by the reality of the moment? That is to say, are we unwitting innovators? And can the two be combined? It's traditional R&D, either public sector or private sector in formal ways, as opposed to responding to the black swan that COVID has become. So these are broad questions. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll take the easy one. <laughs> Sebastian, you've, you've moved from a field, animal health, which you know most people don't think about it, but it's, on, it's equally important as human health. Uh, after all, COVID uh, as its origin, in the folks next door. <laughs> so zoonotic disease, uh, yeah, have been something, a big focus of animal health company for a long time. Uh, we call it like veterinary public health. We, it moves to under an umbrella called One Health, uh, where the health of the environment is uh, as important as our environment because they impact each other's. And uh, 
uh, we've seen that with H1N1, uh, with avian flu. Uh, uh, this is another case where we talked about it, but it's a, it's a long history. You know, rabies has dates uh, since a very long time on how, you know, those two things are intertwined. But as I say frequently, animal health leads you to everything from uh, traceability to um, food, uh, on the production animal side and, and uh, very, very technology because uh, there's a big component around the productivity gain and automation of farms uh, the same way. Uh, but I think to answer your first question, uh, and again, it might be only one item that I found as a common denominator. Uh, but uh, I think we can fairly say that, that change is accelerating uh, uh, and people that were really... Uh, on top of those change and trends, have probably adjusted to COVID-19 situation in a better way than the others. I think that's my my probably first big takeaway. Uh, you, you know, the example I think that Christopher raised around the ability to monitor from anywhere a very large plant, whether it's from home or other location, is a good illustration that people that were on top of those type of capabilities before were almost not impacted due to COVID. Other that had to build those capabilities after COVID, it's like almost an impossible task. Uh, the second one is uh, data, data, and data. Um, the ability to uh, understand, manipulate, uh, leverage data, I think is probably fair for any kind of industry at this point. And it's closely related to talent management. So again, I was um, uh, very uh, impressed by Christopher's presentation and Nirupa, of course, but he didn't touch maybe on, on the talent management side. And, but uh, this shortage of people have the competencies to operate uh, very sophisticated technology, whether we are in the construction business, whether we are in a paper mill or in a healthcare environment, there will be shortage. And I think uh, something we have not addressed today is we could see whether it's a smart city concept or are we going to have risk in the future of lack of resources that can manage those very large operating models. And uh, I think these are my like three big takeaways, but feel free to add to it. And, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, other perspectives. Thank you. Very insightful. The common denominator notion. Uh, I've always thought that the formal R&D process uh, was not geared to cope with crisis. But in the construct, go ahead, you're, you're going to, 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 to say. Well, it. you know, what's fascinating about the, the pharma, at least uh, what I've learned, uh, there are no better organization that is supposed to uh, manage risk than a pharma company. Because when you have a 90% failure rate and you have a very strong understanding of how to manage a pipe of a, a very large number of opportunities that you need to constantly understand which one has the highest chance uh, mm -hmm. of succeeding and which one you should uh, uh, remove from the portfolio and when, because you know the risk is too high or it's not going to make it. They have a very, very strong understanding of managing risk and long-term investments over 10 years. But what's fascinating is the difficulty for them still to adjust to new areas, uh, such as transformation of, of uh, digital transformation, despite that um, uh, culture of managing change and, and risk. Uh, Nirupa, would you say in the construction industry and real estate uh, that the question of uh, risk uh, forecast and managing risk as opportunity uh, what have you seen recently in the context of uh, the COVID, uh, the post-COVID, or the emerging post-COVID situation in India in particular? Yes, so basically, you know, the mode in which everybody is in, a, is, in uh, is survival mode, right? Because a lot of us are just looking to kind of stay afloat. You know, we have to figure out how to pay bank loans. There's not enough cash flow. So I think when you're right now when a lot of developers are thinking you know how do i survive this how do i stay afloat i think agility becomes very important because you have to figure out how to keep tweaking your business model and think about um what can i do to save time in my delivery what can i do to enhance my revenues and what can i do to optimize my costs 
So these are the three big questions that any business would ask uh, in order to stay, uh, keep their heads above the water. Uh, the other thing in terms of what you were saying with regards to innovation, right? I think, you know, when, when you're in survival mode, you can't really be thinking about innovating just at that moment. I feel like innovation has to happen in parallel and not a lot of uh, people kind of devote enough time and energy and, and um, uh, money, I would say, resources to innovation. So while we are not the biggest developer um, in, in the country, the, the, the thing is, you, I think anybody, if they want to survive in this business, they have to ask themselves, what is my industry going to look like five years from now? Um, and what am I doing to kind of stay abreast or stay, up, uh, you know, stay ahead of the curve? And if that is the case, I think every business needs to keep have an innovation cell. Um, you know, so we, we set up an accelerator. And the only reason we set up this accelerator was because Nobody in the, in the actual business, our CEOs or our heads of departments, they don't have the time to sit and think about innovation and look at what is the latest technology. Um, you know, that's not their main focus. Their main focus is our quarterly results and the financials and PNL and sales. So it's very important, I would say, to keep uh, a separate team that and and all that team does is to focus on the latest technologies in the industry because quite often the biggest disruptors in any industry don't come from that industry. They come from a different industry. So if you want to know what is happening and if you don't want to become a dinosaur in your business, then I think it's very important to keep a separate uh, team just to look at trends, innovation, technology. And this could be done either in the form of an incubator, accelerator, R&D department, whatever it is. Among the uh, startups that you have funded, are there some of them standing out that you want to share with us in terms of their uh, p potential for innovation, being uh, trailblazers, p potentially anticipating the challenges of the future or the immediate future anyway? You know, honestly, for me, I think the, my, my favorites are the sustainability startups, the ones that look at water okay. management because water is going to be a scarce resource. Uh, the ones that look at energy management because the kind of what we are, uh, sustainable energy is going to become key for our survival. Um, the ones that look at clean air technology because the air we are breathing is so polluted. So for me, I like the energy startup. So for uh, water, we have this company called We Got. Uh, for air, we have air, clean air management, we have Clairco. And for, um, which was the other one that I mentioned, um, for sustainability in general, there is a company called Smarter Dharma that helps developers think about how to create zero carbon footprint projects, which I think is key if uh, looking at the way the urbanization is happening in India. We have some questions from the audience uh, and they really uh, are directed to some extent to Chris uh, and also to, to all of you actually, but first uh, to Chris, uh, a question here, uh, uh, asks, what is the alternative to bamboo-based pulp? I'm sure I cannot answer that, but go ahead, tell us. <laughs> so, so bamboo is used in some parts of the world for making pulp for paper making, certainly. And uh, my former employer looked at bamboo for, mm. for paper towels, for instance. It's a nice long fiber to replace wood and where you can grow bamboo. I think it uh, is an alternative to forests where Many forests cannot grow in all lands due to aridness. Uh, so you can grow bamboo and you can pulp it quite well for making uh, pulp products for making paper. Uh, we, I see it in molded fiber products. I see it in uh, hand towels. Uh, I see other alternatives to wood as well, like uh, bagasse from sugarcane is used a lot in notebook paper in Central and South America. I, I see uh, uh, some interest now, particularly in the biomass left over from pineapple harvesting. Uh, so if you look back to 2000 years, alternatives to trees have always been used to make paper products, depending on the environment in which you're, you're living. Uh, and hemp was uh, very popular 2000 years ago and is now becoming popular again, particularly as a byproduct from cannabinoid oil extraction from the hemp product. So. Uh, so these are all uh, potentially exploited biomasses for energy, for making ethanol, but also for making paper. Thank you. I have a tough one, and this one is directed at Sebastian. Yeah. Sebastian. What is the ETA estimated arrival time for a human vaccine 
uh, relating to SARS-CoV-2. You've, you've been involved with a lot of vaccines in aviary, in animal health, large animals. Uh, are we going to be vaccinating the bats first and then the humans next? Well, you know, it's a, it's a tough question. I had the, the opportunity to read it before it came, so uh, I had a chance to think about how to respond. But uh, I'm going to start by saying be careful of the fake news. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kidding and halfway kidding. I mean, we, we are in an environment where uh, it is very hard to um, make sure that the information we are receiving is, is, uh, is well curated and, and uh, it's not just a news uh, effect that could, could be for uh, political reason or financial reasons. So I am uh, very careful. I, I, have, I, I could fairly say I don't have the competency to respond uh, to that question. I know that vaccine traditionally is around six or seven years process. Uh, the cycle for, uh, as you know, flu vaccine is every year there are different strains and, and people now have a good hand on how to adjust to the strains. The good news, I think, is that uh, coronavirus, uh, is, uh, there's a very large class of, of, of them. Um, many have been successfully, uh, you know, we have vaccines in the animal health uh, for many of those forms. So we can hope that um, uh, we will find vaccines. Um, you've heard the same news that I do uh, in the news that, you know, some vaccines already existing in Russia and China uh, that are being used. And um, there are uh, companies that are now move, moving to clinical trial uh, aspect. So uh, I, the only thing I can say is that I have been fascinated by uh, the innovation in terms of collaboration between companies. I gave a few examples that there are things happening there. Um, and there are unprecedented resources that have been allocated to it. You know, you looked at what um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have allocated and said, you know, they would like build six plants to uh, be ready for any kind of type of vaccines to be able to start uh, production as fast as um, uh, and build cap uh, capabilities in terms of um, uh, quantities. So uh, I cannot say if it's going to be like two or three years uh, or early Q1 to 2021. And um, I wish I know I knew. Thank you. It's not a fair question, but thank you for trying to answer it. Uh, one last question before we turn to our keynoter, uh, directed uh, at you, Nirupa. It's uh, what is the time frame for pre-COVID normal coming back to Bangalore? Um, I don't want to say the word "new normal" again because I think I've heard it too too often. Yes. <laughs> but I, but quite frankly, um, it depends, right? I mean, every sector is different. Residential is seeing some uh, pre-COVID levels again. But it's different for hotel industry, it's different for the retail industry. Um, those could take about 12 months to 18 months, uh, maybe longer. And you know, who knows what pre-COVID levels means, right? I mean, God forbid if there's, who can predict a different strain coming out in 2020 or 2021, God forbid. But um, if you ask me, just assuming, that, assuming no other surprises, probably 12 to 18 months is what I would say. But I'm no crystal, uh, crystal ball gazer, so this is just an estimate. Well, thank you very much. This uh, was a fascinating uh, session looking at uh, the process of uh, post-COVID innovation, a return to more normal times from the perspective of three industries and their innovatory processes. Grateful to you, Nirupa, to be joining us in what is now your evening period, to Sebastian, to Christopher, thank you very much.